Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I chat with Makira from Hashcloak and Stoffel Labs. We cover how Makira got her start in the space, the work she did at Chainsafe working on an ETH2 client, how she spun out Hashcloak, a research consulting firm, and her work on privacy-preserving tech like ZK, TEs, and now MPC. We also had to mention her amazing Twitter game throughout the episode, as many people know her by her moniker, Bad Crypto Bitch. We learn what drives the tweet game, but also the wisdom she's picked up over the years as a technical founder driven by curiosity and memes. One thing that we'd actually meant to include in this episode, but didn't because of a recording glitch at the start of the interview, is that Makira and I actually worked together back in 2020. We put together the early iterations of the ZK Mesh newsletter, and she worked with me on this until about 2022, at which point she started to focus more on her hash cloak work. But I wanted to make the link for anyone who's familiar with our monthly newsletter. It's now produced by the ZK Hack team. It's basically a list of links and articles related to current ZK activity. I'll add the link to the ZK Mesh newsletter in the show notes if you want to subscribe. Just kind of a cool link between me and Mikara. Anyway, before we kick off, I want to point you towards the ZK Jobs Board. There you can find job opportunities to work with top teams in ZK. I also want to encourage teams looking for top talent to post your jobs there as well. We've been hearing from more and more projects that used it that they have found excellent talent through the ZK Jobs Board. So be sure to check it out. We've added the link in the show notes as well. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Alio. A new era of decentralized privacy-preserving computing is here. Alio, a layer one blockchain powered by zero knowledge cryptography, recently announced their mainnet launch. Now developers can build applications that take advantage of Alio's unique combination of permissionlessness, programmability, and privacy. Start by learning their domain-specific programming language, Leo. Write and deploy your first ZK application at leo-lang.org, or head on over to alio.org to learn more about their technology and what you can build. Alio, this is zero knowledge without compromises. So thanks again, Alio. And now, here's our episode. Today, I'm here with Makira from Hashcloak and Stoffel Labs. Welcome to the show, Makira. Hello, thank you for having me. So I'm very excited to have this episode with you. We've known each other for some time. I know we've also been trying to have this episode recorded for quite a while. Um, So it's great to have you on. Like just before we started, we were talking a little bit about when we met. And in my head, we met in 2019 when you invented the term snark timber. But you just said to me that we actually met before. How did we meet? <laughs> yeah. So the first time we met, in my memory, was at DEF CON 4 in Prague. Okay. Um, Jing from Plasma Group at the time uh, introduced us. We chatted a little bit about the Bulletproof episode, which was yeah. like very cutting edge at the time. But yeah, this is like stuck in my in my memory. But somehow, like when we met again, you didn't remember. So I'm I guess sorry. this is before I was famous. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit before you were famous. Uh-huh. I mean, I was like famous like for people working on like infrastructure layer stuff, like East Two. But I wasn't famous yeah. like everywhere in ZK. Yeah. You definitely weren't famous in ZK. For me, like you, I mean, I I really remember you coining the phrase "snark timber." And this was 2019, summer or fall 2019. This was like the era when we had a ton of research come out all at once. Plonk, Marlin, Sonics, like all of this stuff was around that time. Actually, were you into ZK then? I was looking into it. Okay. However, like at that point, I didn't have the mathematical maturity to understand the papers I was reading. This was around the time like the sapling upgrade came about. Zcash, Starks had come out. Um, but yeah, I hadn't really taken like the coursework to understand a lot of that math. Um, so a lot of it was like hard to read and decipher. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So, but let's go back a little earlier. So, you know, we're talking about like when we met, but your story in blockchain had already started. Let's go back to like what got you first interested enough to like jump in. Right. Um, so to jump in basically. This professor at my university organized uh, a talk by Vitalik. Um, mm. And this was during exam season. 
and I should have been studying, but you know, <laughs> looking back at it, it was the best decision I it did. And yeah, um, yeah. so I went to this talk by Vitalik. Um, it was about crypto economics. He's given this talk a few times. There's a few talks recorded on YouTube. And afterwards, I walked up to the prof and asked if I can be a research assistant for the summer. Um, and then that's how I like actually got started. Before then, I just had heard of crypto. Um, I played around with like some of the tooling. I played around with Mist. But mm. um, nothing actually involving other people, just like as a hobby. Yeah. Um, what era is this? This what is time like frame? the first like Ethereum driven bull market. So like 2017, okay. 2018 era. Okay. So you're working for your professor for a period of time. Yeah. How did you then, because I know you worked at Chainsafe uh, like pretty soon after that. What was that transition like? Yeah. So during the summer, um, we worked on this project and somehow like Chainsafe got involved in this project. I think they were meant to be like development partner, partner in some way. Mm. Honestly, I, I don't know the sort of story myself. I just remember like going to one of the meetings and then Chainsafe folks were there. And so that's how I got connected to them. And then for like the, the next year, they invited me to like work there. Um, and based, based off like the previous summer of doing research. So basically I was doing research at Chainsafe for about a year and a half. Um, and then while there, that's when, um, I started Lodestar, which is now like the TypeScript Ethereum 2 client. Um, mm. but back then it was in JavaScript and it was like poorly written by me in this like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, there wasn't much, right. Um, this okay. was around the time of the e EIP 1011, mm. um, where, Ethereum was like going to do hybrid proof of stake and proof of work, but then Vitalik somehow like published this new spec, said sol sharding was solved, and decided to like push some like Python code. Um, and at that point, like everybody who was like adjacent to Ethereum development research sort of transitioned to implementing that spec. There wasn't a lot to implement, frankly. It was just like a lot of data structures. There was like no networking, yeah, no storage, yeah. like no actual engineering. So basically, I just did like the easy things. Um, I did not really do the hard things, but that was like kind of like the start of me being more active in Ethereum. Um, I was able to get like a Ethereum Foundation grant. Um, they were doing like grants for students at the time. Um, so I got that. Chainsafe obviously like paid my salary. Um, I was still doing work for Chainsafe outside of Lodestar, right? Like I was like helping them do consulting for a major client of theirs. Um, so that's what I spent like my summer of 2018 doing. Okay. And then I had to go back to being a student but, you know, there's like a lot of FOMO and uh, <laughs> less and less interest in studies, maybe. Yeah, basically. But like, it's I probably kind of, yeah. it's good you did it, though, right? Yeah. Like, it, do you feel like it still gave you a bit of a foundation? Yeah. Or like an important foundation? Yeah, yeah. Like I chose like my majors because I was interested in cryptography. So like mm. I don't regret like going. Um, I just like I can like go off and, you know, pursue something that nobody else can pursue. Or I can like continue pursuing the current thing. Um, so it just ended up being like a very unfocused semester for me. But um, the nice thing that came out of the semester is I went to DevCon. That was the first time we met with yeah. the other Ethereum researchers and developers from everywhere, right? Like mm. anybody who was like attached to, um, in some way, the effort of like building Ethereum 2 was there. And then a little bit after that, you know, I had to go back, finish my my finals stuff like that. Did you feel on the fence at the time? Were you kind of like torn? Because you were doing a lot of this other work, but I guess you like, it wasn't like full-time work. You couldn't fully commit to it, but you had this yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was torn because it was like towards the end anyway. Um, and like at that point, my grades didn't matter, matter that much. And I had like an end to grad school. Mm. So basically I just had to like maintain grades for grad school because I was planning on doing research in, into grad school on blockchain related stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. But I was already like working on research. I was like getting paid to do it. I had met all these people at, in Prague. So like it felt like I was already kind of there without like, you know, being paid poorly because grad students aren't paid well. And so, yeah, like I wasn't particularly torn with regards to like staying. It was more like most people would just tell you to finish. Um, mm. I just didn't. Um, looking back at it, it was fine. Like it hasn't really stopped me from getting certain opportunities or yeah. like visa issues. But you were also, you were there for multiple years, right? Like what year were you in? Oh, this was fourth year. Fourth so. year. So you're like close to finishing yeah. too. You could actually just go back and finish any time if you wanted to. How many courses are you missing? Like three? Like a semester worth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So whatever that is. But it's true. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe at this point it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, after Prague, I go back to normal life. 
and uh, obviously I'm procrastinating, right? But I still have to do my finals. Mm. Um, and in the middle of procrastinating, I was on Twitter. There's this conversation with Amin Soleimani of Spank Chain and Xerox Bell and a few other things, trying to sort of prod at as to like why we can't get to ETH two faster. Yeah. Um, and basically the biggest issue was that a lot of the teams doing like a lot of the heavy lifting at the time, they were not full time on ETH two. Um, so in my case, I was a student. I was not focused. I was like not even working at Chainsafe full time. It was part time. Um, and for a lot of the other teams, they had people who like had a day job. So that was like the source of like a lot of the frustration. And so Vitalik, out of his own personal money, sort of started donating to teams who needed like more funds to like set aside like a dedicated internal team to f- work full time on Ethereum, basically. Mm. At first, he donated to Prismatic Labs. Um, and then people got excited and then he did, donated to Sigma Prime. These are like the ETH2 client teams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they were not full-time and at the time. So like, it's basically to give enough funding to be able to set aside resources. Um, and then when I saw the Sigma Prime team get money, I tweeted, if Vitalik gives us 100K, I'll drop out. Um, <laughs> and then there's a Twitter thread. I don't know if it's still like easily available, but yeah. basically... Vitalik just needed like an address. And so I hate Slack notoriously. I got scolded I when I was too. at, cha- at Chainsafe <laughs> for not using uh-huh. Slack. Okay. Um, that was their tool though, I guess. Yeah, so like internally yeah. they're using Slack, but you don't want to. Okay. Yeah. So like I, I, I went on and like, you know, nagged the team. And this was like at night too. So it's not like they were <laughs> easily accessible. So I had to like go nag the team and be like, guys, put an address on the website. Vitalik is going to give us money. And it was like such a rush. Uh, and he sent the money and I was like, great, I'll finish my last exam and then go drop out. Um, so I went to go do my final exam. It was probability, which is like a notoriously hard course. Mm. Um, and the TA was giving out the exams. And he's like, are you ready? I'm like, no. And he's like, don't worry. <laughs> but to me, it was like, it didn't matter because like after the exam, I was going to go like officially drop out. <gasps> um, and so like in Canada, you, it's not like a injection button. It's sort of like you basically just don't, like enroll for the next semester. Mm. And so that's what I did. And it was like very like exhilarating. Obviously I had to like tell my mom and yeah. then, like, she wasn't happy about it. Was it, were you at all worried? No, because I had a job. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're, you're, you were already on a path. Yeah, yeah. I had a, a job. I was doing stuff. And also again, it was easy to go back. Um, mm-hmm. When I went to drop out, like they explained that like you can always come back. And that's still the case, I guess. So yeah, like I had to tell her but I had a job, so... It wasn't it too was, bad. It was fine. It's not like and you I, were close to the end, so <laughs> yeah. you'd learned enough stuff. Yeah, at that point, I was just, like, padding out my schedule with, like, mm. electives. Yeah. I want to ask you a question in all of this. So, like, at this point, so you're, you've are you joined Chainsafe full-time. Recently, you had a tweet about how you, like, kind of helped invent roll-ups with John Adler. And I'm just curious, time frame-wise, when did this happen? And what does that tweet actually, what do you mean? Right. So John was a PhD student in the lab that I was working on in the summer yeah. of 2017. So at this point, the lab was like doing more like hardware verification. So formal verification of hardware circuits. Mm. Um, but I had like drawn on as like the next generation who's going to do like more blockchain specific research. John was like, very keen on doing a lot of blockchain research, even though his master's was in this hardware verification field. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other people at the lab were also like interested in doing blockchain, but just not as keen as John. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like based off my impression at the time and my memory of the time as well. And so eventually he sort of left his PhD to go work at Consensus and he was working at Scalability at Consensus. And uh, I like obviously being young and like wanted to have publications and stuff. I was like, Hey, can I like help you with your research? And this was just me. I was still at Chainsafe. Okay. Um, but it's not like they had like m- any restrictions on what I can do or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So this was just me like exploring the space. I mean, I had to keep up with what's going on in the space in general anyway. So yeah, like obviously John didn't just like let me have it easy. Um, <laughs> right. In this like lab settings, you interact more with the grad students than with the prof anyway. Okay. Um, so we, we had grown kind of close at the time. Yeah, like he had sent me a few things that he was like working on in the direction and I just had to like guess what it was and mm. kind of how to go about it. And uh, yeah, one night I, I was like looking through Plasma, which was like the leading scalability solution at the time. Millions of dollars went to, into Plasma. Mm. Um, but also concurrently at the time in Bitcoin, there was like 
these like block size war- wars yeah. that had like culminated in the splitting of like Bitcoin Cash into its own blockchain. Um, and those wars were like going on for like a few years. Uh, and I was like following that at the t- same time as well, understanding like what are the scalability issues in, in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. understanding scalability in Ethereum. And uh, like I should post up a, a text to him about like, are you just working on like Plasma and merged uh, mining? And he was like, hmm. let's hop on a call and discuss it. I was Wait, like, was okay. merged mining, this is a Bitcoin term? Yeah. What does that have to do with rollups? Like, is there something in a rollup that's sort of merged mining? So I remember at the time when I was like reading Plasma, a lot of the issues were like regarding like inheriting security from like the parent chain. Mm. And Bitcoin, like way back had, like the community had come up with like, a thing called merge mining where it allows like a miner to like mine on both chains, on like two chains. Um, so obviously like the main chain and then like another chain where you can like add extra functionality. And to me, it was sort of like when I just combined merge mining with Plasma and I just like send that as like a text me- message um, to, to John. It seems like that that's exactly what he was working on. Oh, so I kind cool. of just like guessed it. And then, yeah, that's how like I was able to like contribute to some of the ideas and stuff in the paper. Mm. But John did most of the heavy lifting for sure. Yeah. So that's why I don't make it my my personality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's why it's not in your bio, but rather it's yeah. just one tweet. So it used to be in my bio, actually. Oh, Okay. Yeah. So I've gone through like different waves of like Twitter fandom or stardom. (laughs) So my current wave is NPC. You did have, you had invented Snark Timber. Is that still there? No, that's no longer there. That used to be there. Yeah. I remember that one. I thought that was (laughs) great. I thought that was a great bio mention. Okay. So this one had been there. So, but yeah, I now I'm like kind of curious how, because that must have evolved a lot. Like the Bitcoin merged mining. I mean, that doesn't exactly sound like a sequencer writing to an, you know, uh, like a smart contract platform. Well, like but... rollups now are very different from yeah. like, the paper. Like it's been, it's been like five plus years. So obviously yeah, like yeah. a lot of things have changed since then. Like we formalized, like as a community, we formalized a lot of the things. Mm. Um, we've come up with like better designs for rollups, even in terms of like, just designing like blockchain apps, right? On-chain yeah. apps, like co-processors kind of came out of like seeing rollups as like, an application, mm-hmm. right? Your application is a blockchain. Why not have your application be something that like your application on chain cares more about, right? So uh, ZK Coprocess is like an example of this. Axiom, like allowing on-chain applications to query old um, chain state. Mm-hmm. That's like a specific application and you don't lose security if you like delegate this functionality off to Axiom, for example. Mm. Um, so like the space has come like a long way in how we view rollups and how we like design rollups and stuff like that. So back then there was nothing about sequencers and like the terminology has changed a lot as well. Oh, for sure. That's cool though. Um, You know, we just mentioned your Twitter, uh, your Twitter account, bad crypto bitch, amazing. Why don't you introduce it real quick? Because like, wh- you know, where did it come from? But also when did you create that? Because where, like, did you have that throughout, like, from U of T on, or was it later? Right. So the Twitter account came about right before I went to um, DEF CON 4. Okay. Um, so before then, I was controlling my club's uh, Twitter account. So I started, like, a blockchain club at U of T um, okay. as a student. Um, and we had a Twitter account. And I was doing a lot of my interactions through that account. Um, and then obviously, just at a certain point, like, I couldn't do things through that account. Um, <laughs> there were certain things you were not allowed to say. <laughs> well, no, no, that was not allowed oh, to okay, say, okay. but it was like the kinds of trolling that I do now, yeah. I was doing it through like a club account and that look yeah. wasn't, it's not good. Like <laughs> no. even at 20 years old, I knew like there's a line to draw between like what the club an, an says entity and what account you say. and like my yeah. personal account. <laughs> that, that's good. So I had to start my own account. Um, uh-huh. But I was like the president of the club. So obviously I can like detect that, but I, it's, yeah. at some point, like, you know, just because I was 20 doesn't mean I was like stupid. Like, just you can't be tweeting certain things from your club account. Yeah. So I set up my own separate account. And this was around the time of like Cardi B's like Invasion of Privacy album came out. Right. And it was charting. I had some really good bangers on there. And I was listening to that. And so like Bad Crypto Bitch came out of like just me listening to this album. All right. <laughs> Is that an actual quote from there? No, it has oh, nothing. Okay. It's just like it's just sort of vibe wise similar. Yeah, it's just like Cardi B's music at the time is like very like if you're in like in a bad mood, it gets it makes you confident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so bad crypto bitch was the the Twitter handle. I can't change it now. The space has changed a lot. 
Um, so like if I were to create it now, I'd have to be like more professional or something. But yeah, no, it's stuck. People like it's it. Stuck. People like recognize it. it. Yeah, that's the story of the the birth <laughs> of the bad crypto bitch account. What about um, hash cloak? So like so far, we've learned a lot about kind of you're at Chainsafe. You're full time at Chainsafe. You're working with them on different projects. You're at the same time doing this ETH2 client. So the ETH2 client was at Chainsafe. It was at Chainsafe. Okay, yes, so it's yes, connected yes. to it. Yeah. But how does Hashcloak happen? And maybe also where does like ZK happen? Right. So at that point I had dropped out. Um, so I had like more time to like think about just what I wanted to do in general. Mm-hmm. And cryptography and privacy was always like an interest of mine. And I wanted to like pursue that more. And I love the tasks that I just assigned myself at Chainsafe were like less focused on Lodestar and more focused on like P2P and privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just gotten away and, you know, it got me in trouble and, uh, you know, I took full responsibility for it. I should have just like, you know, talked to them and like asked, hey, can I work on this other stuff or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, but instead I just like, this is like interfering and I wanted to focus more on, on privacy. I felt like I was like very neglected. This was around the time Tuno Cash had launched. Oh, yeah. um, so this was like pretty important. Is this late 2019? So like Tuno Cash was launched, I think in 2019, but the people working on it, like had a lot of community support. Like Molok Dao was like funding a lot of the audits and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so I'd been like following all at the time. E2 was fun and I learned a lot. But like my, the way like my attention span works is like, if something is like pulling me to do that more, I typically just like do that instead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I left Chainsafe to start Hashlook and Hashlook was just this like legal vehicle to like allow me to do any sort of consulting, take grants, um, in like a more tax, like tax efficient manner than just doing mm-hmm. it for myself. Um, but I had savings. I just like lived off of those for a bit and, uh, I had allowed me to work on whatever I wanted. I explored different layers of the stack. Like I worked on Mixnets for four years. Mm. Um, I didn't chill it much on Twitter, but a-, a lot of the stuff that we did was public. So I can always like, you know, if somebody cares, I can always talk about that later. Um, but. Did you um, have people working with you at the start? Like, cause I know you do have a team now, but like, was it a, was it just you? Yeah, it was just me. Um, I just wanted to explore, um, different aspects of cryptography. And at this point I had the mathematical maturity to understand a lot of the papers that was, was coming out when I tried earlier on. I just did not know what a field was. I had not taken like algebra. Um, I took linear algebra, but that's not the same. So yeah, at this point I had like a lot of mathematical maturity. Um, I can like go back and revisit papers. I had the time to do that. Um, I can explore like more uh, obscure aspects of like PDP networking and just like be on my own time. That's basically why I started Hashlook. At Hashlook, we morphed into like a regular cryptography consulting firm. We do like a lot of long-term um, engagements related to like R&D and cryptography for clients. Mm. Did Hashcloak become an auditing firm? Like what kind of work have you done since then? So what happened was one of our clients, Fuel Labs, uh, mm-hmm. in the early days, they needed some work done. And uh, I love this early work was on cryptography. So there was like a trend at the time to use BLS signatures to make certain aspects of rollups um, a bit more efficient. Now everybody just uses ZK, but back then people were very focused on BLS signatures. But then a little thing called DeFi Summer in 2020 <laughs> <Yeah>. came up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for like a year and a bit, I was actually, people are always looking for auditors, but I was saying no to a lot of that because that's mm-hmm. not what I wanted to spend my time on. But DeFi Summer happened and uh, Fuel Labs couldn't get an audit. And so they asked me to do it. And then once you do one audit, you're kind of like people just get to know that you're doing audits. And so you get a lot of just business that way. Yeah. So I never needed to do much marketing. Um, so like the audit stuff is like one thing that we do. A lot of it is mostly mm-hmm. just like this R&D stuff that um, we do on behalf of clients. And that's the yeah. stuff that I guess gets you really excited yeah. And then also I have like my own internal, like whatever is interesting me at the time. Yeah. So, so yeah, like I said, mixed nuts. I worked on that for four years. I just did a bad job of showing it, but um, we got like grant funding, just code. Um, cool. Which ecosystems did you do that for? Like a networking solution. So could be for anything. It could be for anything. But who who funded it though, if you did do? Yeah. So we got two grants, uh, one from Binance X Fellowship. Okay. Um, so Binance was running this like grant program way back um and a bunch of people that i n- know had gotten it so i asked them like oh how do you apply and then that's how i got it uh ethereum foundation okay yeah 
that's why I was kind of curious, which, yeah, it sounds like. Yeah. I sort of said this earlier, but I feel like your narrative right now is very MPC focused. So like MPC is the center of your, that's like in your heart. And then there's other pro- other things like FHE or T's that seem to get sort of like some disdain. And there's a lot of like comparisons. And like, I don't know if you want to summarize your your thesis right now on on MPC versus the world, but I'd, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> I mean, I think... I think a lot of people are, like, too married to, like, their specific thing. Mm. Like, it's just easy for, like, Twitter and the algorithm to, like, shit on different things because that's what it prioritizes. But, like, my personal opinion is that we're going to need all of this stuff in some way or another um, in different configurations. And I guess I can be nuanced like that, but that doesn't give me the engagement that I need to show. (laughs) So instead, (laughs) you place it in a battle scenario. I love this, though. I love that you're sharing like the nuanced view is that you totally see them all as like collaborative technologies and we should like work, you know, have them all working together. I think that is actually what most people think. But I think it's also funny to see them being (laughs) pitted against each other. And I've had over the years, people try to tell me that like one of these technologies would just like actually beat out ZK, that ZK will become obsolete because T's, because FHE, because MPC. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I I, like so far I haven't seen it happen. So it also doesn't make sense. Um, Right. Like, I think we kind of just like have this umbrella of like privacy, privacy enhancing tech. Uh, for all of this, and we just think like, oh, you can apply it in every single instance you'd apply a ZKP or something like that. Mm. But really, it comes down to like your application design, right? And I think like a lot of people don't think deeply about how to design their applications and like what their needs are. Mm. Um, they just try to like use whatever trendy thing for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's like very VC driven, maybe it's not, or narrative driven and whatever. But yeah. um, really, it just comes down to like what does your application need and how can you get there and you know sometimes you need zk sometimes you need npc sometimes you need Mm -hmm. some combination of of all of them yeah i think that's like how i think about this another thing is everybody sees like each of these things as like a thing that's gonna take over everything which is Mm -hmm. weird um and it's coming from people who should know better (laughs) yeah yeah something I, i at the same time i yeah i feel like you've you've also highlighted some of the like hypocrisy in some of the marketing like so if i could summarize roughly what you often tweet it's like mpc is your fave fhe over promises and t is being pushed down our throats you have one (laughs) quite graphic tweet about that one (laughs) so but i feel like that is a little bit of a summary of like the story that you're telling and i i sort of want to explore a little bit of that like because i i don't think you're saying mpc wins all but clearly you're working on an mpc project so like that is kind of what you're focused on but yeah do you want to talk like can we talk a little bit about like the fhe world i mean fhe and t kind of get full compared right because it's like these private spaces where like computation can happen i don't know that mpc and fhe get directly compared as much but yeah what are you thinking on that i mean i think it's just a matter of like narratives like whoever pays like these influencers to like shove stuff down our throat mm. um and like attends all these conferences what gets the most sort of mind share and so it's like hilarious like looking through through crypto that somehow like fhe like made the jump but this other stuff is like not as prominent Mm. Um, when you get out of like magical internet money crypto and into regular crypto those same people like more focused on like npc or, or some other thing um so it's like super interesting seeing like the, the economies there because there's actually like a lot of people doing npc stuff um in general it's just you know they're not working in magical internet money crypto they're working mm. in like enterprisey stuff but the tech is like repurposable to magical internet money crypto and so yeah, yeah, that is that's like pretty interesting because yeah, I remember seeing like a lot of people doing FHE work when I was trying to get into cryptography stuff, and a lot of that stuff is just like unusable. Like whenever mm-hmm. I would see somebody tweet about FHE, I'm like, have you tried using any of the available tooling? It's kind of unusable, and so like even from people that I've heard who are connected to teams at major tech companies, 
Mm-hmm. Um, when they talk about FHC, even they're not like super optimistic about it. Wow. Um, so it's like super interesting to see that in crypto. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of over promises about FHC, but there are teams in crypto doing like things that are not over promising. They don't get a lot of attention though. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I feel like I should probably write a Twitter thread about them now that I have a bit of uh, shilling power. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, because there's, there's people like doing like really cool stuff with, with FHE and like those people are, are like doing stuff that really delineates like the differences between when you'd use FHE, when you'd use like some other variants, when you'd use yeah. FPC and stuff like that. But they don't get that much attention. So I should probably mm. highlight them soon. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like with FHE, like I also kind of have the impression that like some of the FHE potential like it is a potential but like we're far from that potential and yet sometimes it, we're being sold fhe as though we've reached that potential but if you choose like a very narrow use case maybe something simpler then fhe maybe is at the level where it could be used right like it's it's sort of the le- like how generalizable is it how huge like a computation can you do within an FHE environment? Like, isn't that sort of if you if you go narrower and simpler, that actually maybe it is possible? Would you would you say that's the case? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's like a lot of sort of web two use cases where FHE is like usable. And that's why like a lot mm-hmm. of big tech companies have research teams focused on FHE, because like they have direct applications where yeah. they can use it. So yeah, like I, I agree with that. Um, I think for for crypto, it's still like, you know, debatable whether it's useful or not. Simple, we just haven't like seen much. Um, mm-hmm. We've seen demos, but at least give me a production level demo or something, then I can like change my tweets. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Prove it, yeah. <laughs> and then bad crypto bitch won't mean tweet you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> what about teas? We just did an episode like a few weeks ago with Andrew Miller, who also mentioned you. So do you like teas? Cause like I don't hate teas. Okay. I don't have any reason to, to hate them. It's it's weird that like I don't know. I think I've come off of like very aggressive on Twitter, so people think I hate things. But it's like <laughs> no. No, so like teas are very useful. My concern always just goes back to like application design. Mm-hmm. Cause there are people who hate teas and like they will make it their yeah. personality. Like in the ZK podcast group on Twitter, like there's a lot of people who genuinely hate teas. And I think that's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Really, it's sort of like, it depends what your application needs. And to just like give up and say, oh, we can't use teas is like kind of anti-science or like anti-truth. Um, and really we should be trying to like make them more palatable because there are use cases where um, they are useful. Um, and so like Andrew's like, you know, doing a lot of that heavy lifting and trying to make them more palatable. And I think that's why it kind of got like a resurgence in the space because like, uh, you know, the stuff at Secret Network happened and people kind of just like dismissed, dismissed teas. Um, even before Secret Network, there's like always an attack yeah. on a tea every year. And so in general, like cryptographers were just like... <laughs> even recently, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> so, like in general, like cryptographers kind of just like, yeah, were like not interested. But it turns out there's like, quite a few interesting use cases for teas and really should like work on trying to like make those like vulnerabilities or issues more palatable. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, we all use, you know, Twitter and whatever and you put all your thoughts on there. Or maybe you don't. Depends on how you use it. I don't. Yeah. I'm pretty <laughs> I'm pretty chill on Twitter. <laughs> right. And there's a risk to doing that, right? And you mm. still you still like use Twitter in the way that you do. So I would argue that like Doing stuff on Twitter is like worse than doing it in a tea. Depen- mm-hmm. I guess maybe that's like a broad, that's like a very broad statement. It's like a bad statement to make. Like but- tea is more <laughs> private than Twitter is what you're saying. <laughs> like, you I'm just saying it. like, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there are things that we use in, in technology that have like sets of trade-offs that might be palatable, but are still not mm-hmm. great to have, right? Like people still use Facebook and Google and all of these things, even though like they actively harm you. But the difference there is you know you're acting in public, or you should. Facebook, maybe it's a bit more like, I think people think they're working in a more private environment often on Facebook than they actually are. But on Twitter, you know you're public. But you can protect your Twitter account. Yeah, I guess if you have a private Twitter, but still, like, I don't I guess the, really the point is that, why. like, there's a lot of tech in which, like, in order to use it, we make some form of trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the call, we hate Slack, but we have to deal with clients. So we still Mm -hmm. use it somewhat, but then we don't use it for like our day-to-day. 
um, as an example. And like, you kind of have to see not just teas, but like all of this stuff is in the same vein, right? You're going to have to make some trade offs somewhere. You're not going to get the, the most perfect system out of using like ZK or whatever, or teas or whatever. So like these people who like hate teas, I'm just like, yeah, there's use cases where this is useful. You may not like mm. the trade offs, but then what is like, what is the alternative? Mm. And so like teas help with stuff like that. So I've been like sort of trying to understand how to use teas for NPC. I think Andrew like brought up some like good examples of that um, in the part in the previous episode. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that, that's like been my thing is just trying to be an open, like, have an open mind when thinking about teas. But obviously I'm just like trying to be trendy with, with my Twitter. <laughs> trying to take the piss because it gets a little bit of, yeah, yeah. a little bit of legs. Yeah. Um, what about ZK though? We talked a little bit at the beginning about what you you know, how I met you and the, yeah. the stuff we were doing around ZK. But like, what has your relationship to ZK been? Because in a way, like you seem much more focused on MPC. It's funny, like I in the tweets that, that you have, it's often like a three-way battle. Where it's like there's th- <laughs> these three players are sort of like put in some co- constellation and ZK is often not there. So I'm wondering, yeah. I mean, like, my earlier memes from this year have a lot of ZK in them. Okay, um, okay. I guess like personally, so... Um, a lot of our business at Hashbook is ZK focused because that's where, like, it took like four or five years before people cared about ZK, and so mm-hmm. now we're, like, from me, like, just being active in the rel- relevant communities, we've like gone business that way. Um, nice. So, like, a lot of the team is like focused on ZK. Personally, I've like moved from ZK to MPC because I just think it's like more interesting for me. Mm-hmm. But obviously, for MPC, I have been thinking a lot about ZK. You know about collaborative snarks? Well, I've just been thinking about like computation in general. Okay. Right. So we, we use ZK as this like short term for like snarks when like ZK is meant to be like an extra property you add to snarks. And really like I guess the point of using ZK for blockchains, a lot of it comes down to like verifiability. Um, and how you get that for for just arbitrary programs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about yeah, like collaborative snarks and and stuff like that. So like for what we're doing, uh, we're building an MPC VM. We want the MPC computation to be verifiable. You need a zk proof. Um, I guess you need a snark. At, at minimum, you need a snark. And then if you want to keep certain things private, then you need a zk snark. Yeah. So I do think about zk. Just it's kind of trendy. I can't like. There's no like low hanging fruit like meme ideas that I can like come up with. I think I posted those earlier in the year already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have something in the future. I see. Um, also, we're using the term co snarks recently, so I, I I need to like make fun of that somehow because I made fun of zk tls recently. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there any? I mean. I- it sounds like because your work is so ZK focused that in a way your interests need to be like in a slightly different direction. Yeah. But MPC is also becoming your work. Maybe you can talk a little bit about like what is the work you're doing on MPC? Because like this started as sort of an interest space, but you have no stoffel, which I think we should talk about. So basically for a long time in the space, people have been wanting to do like private smart contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the ways to do that that was proposed a few years ago was like MPC. And a few companies came out like trying to do exactly that and kind of failed. And it's not mm-hmm. clear to me why. Um, at least like when I started getting into MPC, like that was the question. like, why do those companies fail or not launch or whatever? Yeah, it was, it was just like kind of shock to me for why, why that was. And so... Um, in 2019, I went to this IC3 bootcamp that's held every year at Cornell. Uh, Andrew goes to it like every year, and he's always talking about private smart contracts. That's been like a lot of his research over the past decade has been around like doing private smart contracts or private compute. Mm-hmm. And that year, he had given a talk on using MPC as a confidentiality layer, and that got me interested. And then I guess like the next fall, so fall 2020, we started working together on. I guess I just wanted to learn more about MPC, so I was able to like, get like a visiting researcher sort of uh, thing going on. Um, it was like all remote, so nice. it was very informal. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we got to like working together. And this is when like Andrew like introduced me and a few of his other students to like all this MPC infrastructure that academics had written, wow. but had like <gasps> no adoption in the real world. That's um, cool. That's like a treasure trove. It's like, that's, that's like amazing. Yeah. So like a lot of it is like usable. I mean, it's hard to use, but a lot of those academics are like actively updating the, that code 
Mm-hmm. Um, or if they're no longer updating the code, if you send them an email, they'll respond. It was like approachable, I guess. Yeah. So I wanted to just learn more about that stuff. Um, and it somehow got roped into this like sharded exchange project that they were working on internally, I guess. Yeah. One of his students was like looking for something to work on. And so mm-hmm. I guess I just was in those calls and uh, different things were happening. Um, for me, I was just trying to like get a mental model of how do you use MPC outside of just threshold signatures. Um, at that point in 2020, threshold signatures were like the major use case for MPC. And I guess in the current year, there's like a lot of debate about calling threshold signatures MPC. And so I started working on like a AMM. Um, so just like the basic Uniswap equation. But using MPC somehow? Yeah, using MPC framework, like written by some academics. Like how does that, wait, where is the AMM? Is it in it? Is it the trade itself is like done through a multi-party computation or something? So basically what I did is like these frameworks allow you to write MPC circuits, mm-hmm. um, either through an API or through like a, a DSL. Mm-hmm. And so basically th- this allows you to just like write X times Y equals K exactly as as you would in like Solidity. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's basically what I, I did. One of the frameworks I was using didn't have the vision, so I couldn't implement yeah. like everything and then we transferred to a different thing. And then uh, this is a bit of a blur, but like somehow like a bunch of people got roped into this project and... And one of Andrew's students like took the lead and like she actually made it like into her uh, PhD thesis mm. and wrote a ton of the code. I just wrote some like cute lines and some old framework and then did some a little bit of cute stuff. And then somehow like, I don't know, this turned into like a whole PhD thesis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know how, but well, wait, I want to go. Can I go back to the MPC as AMM? Like, I just, I want to understand where is the multi-party in the decks kind of in the trade? Like, is it two parties on each side and they're doing some sort of multi-party computation to make the trade happen? Like, I just don't know who the multi-party is here. Okay, so I guess we can go back a little bit. Um, so basically what these frameworks allow you to do, so basically you define your what your circuit or what your program actually does Yeah. in like one language or API. And then later on, you can define who are the parties. Okay. Um, and at this time, I didn't really understand like what that meant, right? Because I was trying to learn MPC. So mm-hmm. like looking back at it, I don't think I have a good answer for like who was doing what. Okay. I guess if I were to like re-implement it today, I would probably like, have a better answer. Um, but at the time I was like, I don't know what this is. It, I can just write this Python code and have it, it run. It does something. <laughs> it does something. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now let's talk about the present in Stoffel Labs. What is that working on? Is this like a research project? Is it well, a... So, a... so Stoffel Labs is a separate company where okay. um, at Hashlook, while I was doing this research with Andrew and understanding like what was going on, we had to like look into the code for some of these academic frameworks, um, particularly MP speeds. And it turns out like it's actually quite approachable. Like sure, like, you know, the code is in like the best like engineering quality or whatever, but it's still like you can read it and can kind of get the gist of what's going on. It made me realize that, like, why can't we just do this for blockchains or, like, have this as an extension for blockchains in the way that people are doing ZK coprocessors now? I think, mm. uh, yeah, I think at the time we weren't calling things coprocessors. We were calling, like, rollups or sidechains or something else. But basically, yeah, I realized, like, why can't we just do this for blockchains? Um, I started writing an implementation at Hashlook, and then we open sourced it. Um, but it was very, like, still very early days. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, when you're doing consulting and internal projects, the consulting has to come over because you just pay the bills. Come first. <laughs> yeah, yes. It has to come first. Yes, come first. Pays the bills. Um, yes. So we're spinning out that work into its own company so it can have resources, basically. And yeah, that's what Stoffel Labs is, is like working on making a lot of the academic MPC frameworks a bit more production ready and making MPC more accessible to everybody. Obviously, we'll be focused on Web3, but there's like a lot of low-hanging fruit, like Web2 applications that... Mm. Um, We'll also want to explore for this company as well. Is this going to be an MPC framework? Do you imagine it being a collection of libraries? Do you imagine it being a, a DSL? Or do you imagine building like the actual coprocessor or like some sort of environment? Uh, so basically, the way we're doing it is, I guess the, the way to explain it would be probably con- contrasting it to like ZK infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So if you're familiar with like Risk Zero, what it allows you to do, um, you write your program in Rust compiles down to RISC-V bytecode, and then the RISC-V bytecode runs in RISC-0's like VM. 
Yeah. Um, we're doing like, something similar to that, except our VM is a custom IPC VM. We have our own ISA. We're not using an existing ISA, like Risk Five or MIPS or, or whatever. Okay. And yeah, it's like very similar to sort of that, mm. that kind of framework. So we are going to go with a DSL, but like you can always like emit the DSL and like build out like an LLVM infra and mm. have like people write Rust and compile down to the MPC VM. All of that is on the table. But, it may yeah. still be Rust, the language that you're actually using, but you're not going to use like the RISC-V instruction set. Yeah. I see. I guess, yeah, there's like compiling. There's the possibility to compile instead. Well, like the reason for that is because like MPC is just a different kind of computing paradigm. Like things are not done locally. Mm. And so basically it made more sense to just um, use like an existing like academic framework that took into account those like design constraints Mm -hmm. and those existing academic frameworks already have like a custom isa for mpc so it makes sense to just like take that and you know make it a a little bit more like developer friendly or some improvements to it Mm. because yeah like reusing risk 5 isn't like a bad idea but it does have its own set of constraints right it's kind of like the difference between like risk zero and valida where valida also has its own custom isa for its ckvm okay one thing that Like those systems promise those like verifiable compute. That's like the feature. Does MPC offer something like that too? It doesn't offer, like an MPC VM doesn't necessarily offer out of the box a verifiable compute, but it can. Mm -hmm. What we offer is like, you know, private distributed compute. Okay. So it's more, I mean, it's focused more on the private part. And actually, I guess with an MPC too, you don't have this prover issue where like the prover can sometimes be the especially if you have like a centralized prover it it sort of removes the the privacy part or it makes like someone some prover is going to see what's trying to be made private with mpc as far as i understand that isn't the case so like the privacy part it's like in this joint environment that no one can see right so the nodes are, are operating over secret shares so you don't so the nodes individually don't see the private inputs, which would mm-hmm. be secret shared. However, there's like collusion issues okay. with MPC. And like in papers, they kind of just like brush it off. Um, right. So you have like these different uh different like threat models for MPC. Mm-hmm. Um, like this honest majority, um, honest majority, active security, passive adversary, stuff like this. And depending on like your threat model, you get different properties of like what your committee can do. And that's like actually like a an issue in like practical deployments of MPC, right? So in practice, like a lot of deployments sort of just assume most nodes are like honest, or if they're not honest, some you know you're like beholden to some contract, some sort of practical deployment job is made there, mm-hmm. right? So like that's actually like a a major issue, um, and I get, I think Andrew might have brought that up in the episode, um, where you can use TEs to help with like collusion, preventing collusion of MPC nodes. Interesting. Um, so like that's like a, a way to solve that. Um, but yeah, outside of collusion, uh, the MPC node shouldn't see your secret shares, and uh, outside of like bugs in your code as well. Right. Yeah, I should also maybe add the kind of thing I was saying about zk and the prover scene stuff. There are actually solutions out there where they are truly zk, where they'll do cl- zk in the client side, and then maybe have a prover prove those proofs, but it's still kind of private. But yeah, with MPC, it's it's interesting because like as a design space, I I definitely have not explored it much. I feel like in the last year, I think we've talked about MPC. We've had like proper MPC episodes like two or three times. So it's like not much. Yeah, I definitely would like to see more of what's possible, like the kind of paradigms that are just different things that are created that wouldn't be created with any other tech. Do you see though, so like you kind of gave an example here of like T's helping MPC to help with this collusion issue, but do you see some overlap with other technologies? Would you sometimes think like, oh, I wish I wasn't using this. I wish I was using something else. <laughs> like, I know you maybe not because the MPC is like the passion, but yeah. Well, I guess not that it's a passion. It's more like, I think going back to something I said earlier in the episode, like people try to use like ZK, if it's she, whatever, for like everything, mm. as opposed to just like looking at the problem at hand and like seeing what what you actually need for your problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is probably like one of the issues with MPC in the past is that people like want to do everything with MPC as opposed yeah. to like looking up where it's actually useful um, or like making efforts to like find where, where those areas are. Mm-hmm. So I guess like back to the question of uh, is there intersection of MPC with other things? I mean, I think we brought it up with ZK, right? Just like 
private input um, mm-hmm. situation, right? There's like a few companies working on distributing proving and that uses MPC. Mm-hmm. So that's like a area of intersection. Um, for FHE, I think some of my memes kind of bring this up a lot. <laughs> so, you know, like for practical FHE deployment, um, you have to like split the decryption keys. Otherwise, like even like an honest but curious server can like potentially decrypt your your cipher text. Mm. Um, and so you would use MPC for splitting decryption keys. So that would be like intersection to like those things. Mm-hmm. Actually, it brings me back to kind of what you said, like the th- what is good for what in you describing MPC in this system that you set up, like you sort of mentioned the privacy component, but like is the problem that you're trying to solve creating an environment for private compute better? Like I'm trying to figure out if it's like, yeah, what's the add on? What's the additional benefit of using MPC? Because there are obviously lots of projects that are using ZK for private compute. Is there an efficiency gain when you do it with MPC? What is it about that system that sort of makes it a better fit to use MPC? Uh, right. So I would say in order to do like more interesting private computes, you need a way for everybody to access your private information, right? So the issue with ZK is that basically if you like take at face value, like a lot of the definitions for like ZK snarks, it kind of just says like you're a, a prover and you want to prove something to somebody else and it assumes that you have the data and you, know, you don't want to share that data. Mm-hmm. Um, but what if you want somebody else to like do some interesting thing over your data? In that case, like with ZK, you're still kind of limited, right? So you mentioned earlier on where there's like designs where people still do like a proof client side, but then they mm-hmm. have to send the proof to some other thing. And that kind of like limits what you can do because yeah, now you're like, you know, constrained more by like engineering slash like application design mm. um, as opposed to like the issues with CK. Like at that point, you're kind of just like trying to like square peg in a round hole or whatever. <laughs> square peg <laughs> in a round hole. Or is it like the that? opposite? Like at that point, it's sort of like, would you not explore something else? Um, I think for a long time, people just use T's for that. And, you know, T's has its set of issues um, that a lot of people seem to hate. And so there wasn't like a lot of good options. And so MPC and FHE kind of occupy this space of it lets you do stuff over encrypted data. Interesting. Um, or private data. Yeah. And I think from what I heard about MPC too, it's just like you can do something over private data and then that data can also have more things done to it because it sort of all stays in this fully private environment, right? Like it never, it doesn't yeah. have to, there's no like you yourself in the ZK se- sense, if you're the prover, you you see the information. So some person is going to see the information at some point and you can maybe do some sort of computation in a ZK environment that's private, but it's not that it can then remain in this private zone and like more can happen to it as far as I can tell. Yeah. So there's different models, like security models for MPC. Um, and like a popular one is like delegated security where you don't want to do the computation yourself, but there's like some servers in which like you can send them your information and they somehow like don't see it and then they give you the result. And in that case, you're kind of like giving up some form of like sovereignty over your data, but like secret sharing it. Whereas like in the case of FHE where you encrypt it yourself and then you send it over. So like that's like a very common like paradigm for for MPC. And yes, it allows you to like once that's done, and um, depending on, like, I guess the policies you've set for your program, that data can be stored on a set of MPC servers, uh, a set of nodes. But unviewable to everyone, right? Like, no one can access that. Well, as long as they don't collude, right? Okay. As long as, like, a, yeah, yeah. a threshold of them don't collude, like, no, nobody sees your, your data. Hmm. Um, and that allows you to do more interesting things. Uh, the trade-off you make there is that now you have, you have like, more complicated, you know, security model and uh, threat model there. Um, mm. dealing with this like collusion issue, but it allows you to do more interesting things. So that's like the the bigger trade off there. Yeah, I like this though. This is really helpful. Like this is kind of this is giving me a picture of like why one would want something like this. So that's how you go from like why would you use MPC over over ZK? It's like maybe your application just needs to do like more interesting stuff over private data, and you don't mm. want the liability of managing that, or you don't want to store it yourself. Yeah. Um. In that case. You can do like this delegated like MPC model where you send your data off to a set of nodes and they do the compute um, and then they send you back the, the results. Or if you want, you can like have it be stored amongst the nodes. Um, mm-hmm. And as long as they don't collude, they, nobody should 
see your private data or your the result of your private data or the result of the computation on your private data. Yeah. I feel like this collusion issue is something that I now want to explore a bit more though, because this sounds like this is the crux. This is the the big drawback you've highlighted. Yeah. I mean, even in blockchains, like this is a major issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you know, we've seen 51% attacks in practice. So, um, you know, it's it's not it's not like it's never going to happen that some quorum of like nodes in a, in a PDP network will never attack it, right? And so this this is like an issue for NPC systems. Mm-hmm. And in practice, like I mentioned earlier, the way this is solved is like choosing like an appropriate NPC protocol and a specific security model. Yeah. Um, and then you just have like the nodes be like bound by you know some legal jurisdiction system. Um, you know, you sign contracts with them if they you know deviate. In like a Byzantine way, then sue them. Um, if there's just a bug, then um, hopefully you can recover and you don't sue them. But yeah, like in practice, it's still very kind of, it's not enforced via cryptography or via physics. It's like mm-hmm. enforced via like legal, by the legal system. Yeah. Which I guess to some extent can be true for certain blockchains as well, right? I guess that's like a another episode for another time, depending mm. on who you talk to, like, mm-hmm. or... Or like if you have to like stake into a system and you kind of like validated, are you like bound by like some legal jurisdiction or something? I, I don't know. Um, mm. I'm not the person to ask about that. But yeah, for, for MPC, you have like a similar situation where in practice, when you deploy these nodes, who runs them? Um, how do you make sure they're not like malicious? Mm. Um, how, do, how do you make sure that like, even if they're not malicious, but they go down, you can recover your data. Mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of these questions are questions that plague just distributed systems in general, right? True. Like, what happens to, like, when you can't access Google or Twitter, right? And, and I know there's, like, you know, 30 plus years of um, just, like, practical engineering advice around there um, that you can apply potentially. But then there's some stuff that's specific to NPC where I, I still think there are more engineering problems than there are, like, research problems, frankly. But, yeah, like, I think they're, they're solvable and um, some of the solutions people may not like, but I think they should be palatable. So, like, one of the bigger solutions that's used is T's. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, like a lot of people hate T's, but right now, if you want to deploy NPC in practice, it'd be irresponsible to like not use a T to prevent uh, collusion. Okay. I mean, one day, could it be FHE? I guess it would depend on like what you're building. Yeah, exactly. But, kind of going back to that use case thing. Yeah. But, I haven't seen, yeah. I mean, is there a lot of NPC FHE crossover? Like Nigel Smart says they're the same thing, that FHE is like a version of NPC. Sorry, FHE is a version of MPC? That's what he said, yeah, <laughs> on an episode we did a long time ago. <laughs> oh, I think I think I had a meme that was like... So, like, in the space, a lot of people use the term TFHE, which stands for, like, threshold FHE. Yeah. And that's just, like, MPC with extra steps. Um, so, like, he's not wrong, but I guess the way I typically think about it is the opposite, um, is that MPC is a version of FHE. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> because, like, in a lot of MPC protocols, the way they're implemented is they have like somewhat homomorphic encryption implemented yes. or um, mm. partially but homomorphic encryption. somewhat, yeah, or f- partially, not the fully, yeah. Yeah. Um, so like to me, like I usually think of it as the opposite. Obviously, like I don't make memes out of that. If I make memes out of that, like it's just people It goes gonna, against the yeah. stories. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I, 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 mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe I can like make a meme out of it and like be more nuanced in some way, but... <laughs> As soon as I just put the meme out there. It sounds like, like you're not supposed to be nuanced on Twitter from what you said. <laughs> so maybe I think you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that's how I think about it. Nice. So, Makira, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I know we tried to do this over a month ago. We were actually going to do it in person, kind of roast. Uh, Tarun and I and you were in the same city at the same time, but sadly it was during a hackathon and we didn't actually have any time to record it. This wasn't quite a roast. It was more of a story, but it was really great to get to hear your story. And also I really like the stuff on MPC. Like to me, this is a way of using MPC that I haven't heard before. So yeah, for me, it's pretty, pretty cool to, to learn about. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You know, good thing there's no roast because I would have roasted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but instead, I guess we got this uh, nuanced conversation. Different from your Twitter. I hope it doesn't give my enemies like any ammo against me. I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I love your Twitter. <laughs> I think it's really fun. That's why we mentioned it over like throughout this episode. 
But I also think it's really nice to hear because like, I think you're quite reasonable when, when you meet you in person, you're like quite reasonable about all this stuff. And you have really like good insight. You've been in the space for a long time. You've also consistently explored a little outside of what the crowd is thinking about. You know what I mean? Like everyone's focused on one thing and you're sort of checking out something over there and down the line that becomes really interesting to people. So yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah. I don't know why I think my attention span is just like, if something's mainstream, (laughs) I'll learn it because people will like shove it down your throat. Yeah. So I should probably spend my time on something that's like less mainstream, something that's like more under the radar. Um, And if it turns out it's popular, then at a good time. Yeah. Uh, If it's not popular, then that's great. I always love learning new things. Nice. Go follow me on Twitter. Yeah. Go follow all of the accounts on my Twitter bio. Go see Bo. (laughs) 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 <laughs> Compose kind of things. Yeah. Well, thanks again. I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Rachel, Henrik, and Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.